Good morning. And it's a lot going on today, especially this happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. We honor you, we celebrate you, we know that you have touched many lives. And I'm also talking about the community fathers. And I know we have a lot of community fathers here at St. Luke, um, but also around the country and around the world. So I hope you have some, some um, be good to yourself happenings today on this, uh, on this June 19th, Father's Day, which is also Juneteenth, which we are recognizing. It's now a federal holiday, and rightly so. So Juneteenth is a commemoration of um, the freeing of the enslaved people of, of <coughs> our own country here um, when Abraham Lincoln passed the Emancipation Proclamation. And the 19th of June is commemorated because in Galveston, Texas, it took two years for them to get the memo that enslaved peoples were freed. So in a, it wasn't until 1865 that, uh, that they were actually uh, told that they were free people. So we honor that um, important legislation and we continue to educate ourselves um, and our, our, uh, our community here at St. Luke. Um, about racism and white supremacy, and we are committed to uh, being truly God's love in the world to all people. And then also uh, today, we are decommissioning our orange banner. Now, you'll remember that uh, actually a little over 225 days ago, we brought this orange banner into the sanctuary, which was created by the priceless company Quilters. And it has symbolized for us the uh, indigenous children that were sent to residential boarding schools, uh, separated from their families, stripped of their identity and their culture, and as you know, many of whom uh, lost their lives there. And so um, we were asked as ELC congregations to hang orange banners in our sanctuaries for 225 days, representing the 225 days represents the 225 graves that they found um, that had the, the, the indigenous children buried there unmarked. And they have since discovered more of those lives buried, those children's lives lost. But, um, but that's where the 225 days comes from. So this was hanging at first in our banner area, right up here in the, in the, in the chancel. And then it, it lived um, in the sanctuary, just um, hanging down from the, the balcony there. So we are going to pray about this. The orange color comes from uh, Phyllis Webstad, who, was, who is a survivor of uh, indigenous people's uh, indigenous residential schools. And when she was sent there, her grandmother gave her a brand new orange t-shirt that she was wearing, brand new. And when she got to the school, they took it from her and she never got it back. So this is in honor of that memory. And so our orange banner and our orange shirt day, um, we lift up as we decommission it today with a prayer that Karen's going to offer us. So let us pray. Let us pray. We remember in the symbolism of this orange quilt, the innocent children who were torn from their families, taken to boarding schools, abused by their caretakers, and died so far away from their communities. Hear our prayer for the innocent, sacred lives of all indigenous children who survived, who have been found, and those who remain lost. Move our hearts by your mercy as we acknowledge and repent of all the suffering that our church has caused. Care for the hearts and minds of survivors and relatives as the trauma comes to the surface again. Guide and restore us to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, the reconciler of all that is, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Karen. And now I invite you to rise as we offer our confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves you. Amen. And now our gathering hymn, please join, lift every voice and sing.
holy and righteous God. You created us in your image. Grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us, like those of generations before us who resisted the evil of slavery and human bondage in any form and any manner of oppression. Help us to use our freedoms to bring justice among people and nations everywhere. To the glory of your holy name, we ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. The first reading today is from Isaiah, the 65th chapter, verses 1 to 9. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me. I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills, I will measure into their laps <clears throat> full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it and my 
Servants shall settle there. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is, Paul's, is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, uh, chapter 3, verses 23 to 29. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if ye belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to that promise. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel comes to us from Luke, the eighth chapter. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man from the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with a great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And you may be seated. And let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. He was a man beyond hope. Uncontainable, undirectable, 
completely unable to be held in community. His demons had driven him out from the place he belonged, had driven him out even from his own identity, from his own name. And he was there living among the tombs, living as one dead. I thought I knew the man. I thought I knew this man for whom the forces of devastation had even commandeered his name. But when I knew him many years ago and several towns ago, several states ago even, he was a young woman whose mind and body both bore the scars and pain of a difficult childhood. Pain had been her constant companion until a new doctor came to town and offered her the most wonderful release, Oxycontin. And of course, over time, both with the way Oxycontin works, the way opioids work, as well as our government getting a little bit wiser and our insurance companies catching on to this, by the time I knew her, the Oxy was far out of reach, and instead she was addicted to heroin. She was on the brink of homelessness, she was jobless, and her children had been taken from her. Only a miracle could bring this woman to life again. This woman who, it felt like her very name, her very identity was being swallowed up by this demon of addiction. Maybe you have known someone similar. Whether it's someone whose mental illness just doesn't respond the way we had hoped to the medications and the treatments, and for whom it is costing them their home and their community. Or perhaps it is someone for whom the binding force of addiction has jerked them off the wagon time and again and occasionally under the very wagon wheels itself. Maybe you have known someone whose life is bound by a force greater than our own. I thought I knew the demon-possessed man from our story today. But actually, I was wrong. It turned out to surprise me. Now, if we take a moment, what, what do we hear in our story is the name of the demon? What is it? Legion, which as our story explains, means many. But both in the time of the story with the characters as well as in the time that, that story is first told and heard, the people were living under Roman rule, what was at times a brutal rule. And what was the name of the largest standing unit of a Roman army? Legion. Yes. The power of legion, and, and by the way, legion in um, Encyclopedia Britannica was 3,600 heavy infantry plus enough light infantry and cavalry to make a troop of about 6,000 6, troops, so a very large unit. And it was the power of legion that decimated whole nations and communities that allowed Rome to conquer and oppress. It was the, the fear of the legion that established in those conquered lands a hierarchy, one in which the native peoples were often at the bottom. The fear of legion meant that a Roman soldier could compel a native person to carry his gear for a mile just because. The fear of legion allowed a native person to get beaten and imprisoned without a fair trial, just because. And every bit as devastating as this, the fear of legion also allowed Caesar to tax the peoples ruthlessly, driving many in the community into abject poverty. Some were so financially devastated 
that the only way they could survive was to sell themselves into slavery. And so today, today, as we commemorate Juneteenth, that day when slaves in Texas, some 200 or 250 years after the Emancipation Proclamation was actually issued, that they were finally liberated. Today we celebrate a God who meets legion, who faces the demonic forces of violence, oppression, and despair head on and casts them out. On Good Friday, Jesus is going to open his arms to all of the demonic forces that our world has to offer. Legion will hang him on a cross on that Good Friday. But who is it who's going to be alive on Easter Sunday? Christ Jesus will be the one living, and the powers of legion will have been broken. Hallelujah. That said, I wonder, I wonder why it is, back in our story today, why it is that the good neighbors, the good community around this um, once formerly demon-possessed man, why they don't rejoice in this miraculous liberation? Why don't they bring out all of their sick and blind and lame to come to Jesus for healing? What is it about this healing, this act of liberation that frightens them so? Could it be that they have been so caught for so long in this, this hopelessness, knowing that this man would never be freed, that they have actually given up his place in society? He no longer has a place to go as a liberated man. Could it be that his community is living in despair and cannot embrace the fullness of life? Could it be that Legion has actually infected the community as well, making them blind to the human dignity of their brother who is now freed and in his right mind? Could it be that they have come to value the lives of the pigs as being more valuable than his life? Could it be that they now value making money more than a fellow human being? Or could it be that they're simply afraid of what will happen higher up in the hierarchy of society if they make changes? After all, we've discovered that when we're fairly comfortable in an unjust society, it's often easier, it's definitely easier to simply turn a blind eyes to those whom the injustice is crushing. It's easier to do that than to, to shake the cart because we know that what comes down from above, if we shake the cart, is going to hit us. Could it be? Funny, isn't it, how the demon may have possessed one man, but it truly dispossessed the entire community, stealing from them the fullness of life, causing them to live lives of fear and, dare I say, a boorish life. Oh, no, we dare not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. What we see, the very same Jesus who cast out legion in our story today, who had the victim name that demon and sent that demon out. That same Christ is at work casting out demons today. And today, is, as we uh, retire our orange banner, 
we do so knowing that we will continue to hold before us and honor the lives of the American Indian children that were lost. We also honor Juneteenth and celebrate liberation, as well as we commemorate the Emmanuel Nine, bless you, those who were in a Bible study when a white man killed them. We do our own anti-racism work as individuals and as a community, and it's uncomfortable, and it's hard. It is the work of repentance but it's also something else. It's the work of naming the demon of white supremacy for what it is. And why do we name it? We name it because our God is fixing to kick it out. We get to be a part of God's great work of leveling the hierarchy, lifting up the valleys, lowering the mountains, so that we can all be connected as siblings together not distanced by the heights and the depths, but together as God's beloved children. We get to be part of that wonderful vision so that regardless of skin color, black, brown, white, whatever, we get to come together as God's beloved children. And by the grace of God, all flesh, shall see the salvation of God. Amen. Please join with me as we affirm our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Holy God, you hear the cries of those who seek you. Equip your church with evangelists who reveal the continuous call of your outstretched hands and your promises of a home in you. God of grace, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of the earth, Restore places where land, air, and waterways have been harmed. Guide us to develop and implement sources of energy and food production that do not destroy the earth. God of grace. Yes. You hear the cries of those who are marginalized or cast out. On this Juneteenth observation, guide us continually toward the end of oppression in all its forms, especially white supremacy. Bring true freedom and human flourish, flourishing to all your beloved children. God of grace, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who suffer. Come to the aid of all who are homeless, naked, hungry, and sick. Bring peace to any experiencing mental illness and addiction, that they can clearly recognize your loving presence. God of grace, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who celebrate and those who grieve on this Father's Day. Nurture, nurture mutual love and tender care in all relationships. Comfort those for whom this day brings sadness or longing. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful departed whose lives proclaimed all you had done for them. And the last, unite us with them as we make our home in you. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please pass the peace of God. Peace of God, Dave. Peace of God. Thank you. Be with you. You're doing great. You walking great. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it's great, but, but I'm walking good. You're walking better than you. I'm still on. Okay. I'm still on. I'm going to. as we, you may be seated as we prepare to offer to God what we have first been given through our tithes and offerings. And we appreciate and are grateful for your financial support to the many ministries here at St. Luke that go up, pour out God's love near and far. So we thank you for your generosity. 
other ways to give um, this week to connect. We invite you to write a card to Judy Willis and tell her how much she means to you. Judy has been our service coordinator for s over 16 years and she is well deserving to retire. And so if you, would, if you have time and would be so inclined, I know she would love a card from you talking about her, her beautiful ministries here and the service that she has, has done for St. Luke and touched so many lives. We are also having a reception to honor her um, and it will happen next Sunday the 26th after this service, after the 1030 service and uh, we will have a reception in the patio in the narthex and, and really give Judy a big shout out that day. So I hope you'll be able to stay and come and, and um, give thanks to Judy. Also there are cards in the narthex as Jerry Brennis, our new director of music, comes to St. Luke um, in, in a very short while. He will be here uh, in July, moving from Florida to Portland. So please, if you haven't already, sign uh, one of the cards that's in the narthex welcoming him um, to St. Luke. And then to serve, uh, Grower is and has been gearing up. Grower back to school. Many families are um, looking forward to coming to St. Luke on August 13th um, for getting clothing and school supplies for their children and, and students that will be needing that uh, as they start the next year. So there's a sign up for you to volunteer your time um, the day of August 13th or in preparation for. So please go to the website, uh, weekly update. It's also in your bulletin here and uh, we are grateful for whatever you can give. And so with that, we offer to God our gifts, um, and I invite the ushers to come forward. Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread, and drink from this cup. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And now we offer to God the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
please rise for our post-communion prayer. Join with me. Life-giving God, through this meal, you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm offering your benediction today from uh, the Chinook tradition, a Pacific Northwest tribe. May all I say and all I think be in harmony with thee, God within me, God beyond me, maker of the trees. And may God, mother, father, creator, God the son, liberator, and God the Holy Spirit, divine presence, bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen. And now for our final hymn, please turn to page number 866. We are marching in the light of God. We'll do it in English. <laughs> <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> oh.